Well, welcome back to Hour 2 of the JT Show here on Super Talk Mississippi. Gerard Gibbard along with Rhino. And on the guest line now joining us, Congressman Stephen Palazzo of Mississippi's 4th District. How's it going, Congressman? Thanks for joining us. Hey, Gerard. Um, it's good to be back on the show. Uh, things are good. The sun's shining. It's a Friday um, and I'm in South Mississippi, yeah. so it's a, it's it's a good day. Awesome. Well, so good to hear from you today. And uh, wow, it's it's been uh, I don't know if we can say a lot's been going on in Washington. You guys haven't really uh, been on the hill much lately, have you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's that's true. You know, we were we were up there last week um, to to vote no on the uh, the liberal wish list put together <laughs> by Nancy Pelosi and her her um, her. Her, her minions uh, that really did nothing to uh, help our economy, you know, or, or, or help us get out of this COVID nineteen situation. It was just a massive giveaway, and we just didn't have three trillion dollars sitting around to do that. Um, but it does look like, um, from what I'm hearing, is we're going to have our first vote uh, under the new proxy rules um, next week. And it's and it's actually, um, if if I if I can believe this, if if Nancy Pelosi won't try to make this a partisan issue, but it it is a it is definitely a bipartisan proposal uh, to to provide some flexibility to the paycheck protection program and i I know you've probably been monitoring some of the Mm -hmm. concerns from our restaurants and others is that that eight weeks is just you know from the time you take the money is just not doable for everybody you know one size doesn't fit all uh, when you're talking about industry classifications and small businesses so this will give um some much needed relief uh, to these small businesses who have just not yet been able to open up because of the governors and the federal government's shelter in place and safer at home uh, policies so so Hopefully, if the small businesses out there and they're listening, um, you know, hope, hopefully we can come in here and, and pass this uh, much needed flexibility for small business owners in Mississippi and across the nation. Uh, you know, our side is ready to pass it. We just hope the, um, the other side doesn't tinker with it or try to do some kind of massive pension bailout for unions. <laughs> you know, yeah. they just can't help themselves. They're going to do something or, or you know, maybe take over government control of our election and our electoral process. You know, so we got to just keep an eye on them. Well, and look, you and I both know that you put something together as rapidly as the PPP was. It's it's bound to have challenges, yeah. and though the intent, I think, was uh, was on target. It's just hard to roll those things out, and there's there's been, I think the other thing, frankly, Congressman, that's frustrated a lot of people, including many here uh, in my circles that, that did participate in the program that are business owners and entrepreneurs, it's the constant release of updated guidance from the Revenue Service. And, and you and I both have the accounting background, know how frustrating they can be all the way up to tax filing deadline deadline when they do that and and even more frustrating towards the end of the year on on uh, payroll withholding uh, taxes and so forth but these guys are trying to operate a business and they can't get just you know visibility into okay what is what are the forgiveness rules the final rules going to look like yeah, yeah, and and that's a concern that we're sharing with Treasury. We're sharing with uh, leadership continuously. I'm hearing it. I'm hearing it when CPAs are having difficulty <laughs> exactly. understanding this. You know, the mom and pops have no clue, and you're and, and the, you shouldn't have to actually go hire a CPA or a lawyer to interpret the loan forgiveness, um, pro, you know, uh, guidance that they've put out there. And the I believe it's 11 page application now. So which I, I, I'm probably going to spend the week and doing some pleasure eating and uh, get caught up on that. But but you're right, you know, and another unintended um, consequence of rushing legislation, and that's why we should not rush legislation, but the, this was unprecedented times and yeah. unprecedented action was taking, is the unemployment, the additional $600 per week unemployment. Um, I'm hearing a lot from small businesses, and we got people calling into our office saying, I don't want to go back to work. Yeah. You know, do I do I have to go back to work? I'm, you know, I'm, I'm making more now than I was when I was working. And of course, 
you know, as a as an elected office, I can't tell an employee what to do or what not to do. But I am strongly encouraging people who are on on unemployment if they have the ability to go back to work, go back to work because that job may not be there when these unemployment benefits run out. You'll be you'll be stuck between a rock and a hard place. And Governor Reeves has delivered that exact same message. And, and though technically one should not be eligible for continued benefits if they've been offered work. As you know, the issue is, how do you even get that information to uh, the, the various unemployment agencies across the country? Uh, no employer is going to sit on the phone two or three hours to try to say, hey, I'm trying to hire somebody back, and they, they're not accepting the offer and saying they're going to stay home, therefore they should be ineligible for benefits, because they're overwhelmed with dealing with the uh, unemployment uh, applications and claims uh, from individuals, and it's it's unprecedented, as you said, and it's a very difficult situation. But it, it, when we have a kind of a perverse dynamic where it's it's more beneficial to stay home than work, we got problems. And the sense I get from Pelosi and her group with uh, what they included in this next round of three trillion dollars of uh, relief is they want to just. Uh, continue that, extend that all the way through the end of the year, I believe, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's just one of the many bad things that are in the bill. They're they're wanting to do um, what was it? Uh, the, you know, some form of you know they want to continue the stimulus. And some people were talking about what was it, two thousand dollars per month yeah. per person per family member. Yeah. We 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 don't money doesn't grow on trees, and you know our economy, our our gross domestic product, our revenue is taking a hit, and we need to be focusing primarily on how do we get back to the hot economy, the hottest economy we've had in the history of America before the COVID-19 crisis. Agree. That's that's the only thing we should be focused on, getting the economy running again and getting people back to work. Well, and but you know, that's uh, $3 trillion, and it's an opportunity for them to uh, include everything they want in a single piece of legislation and get it going. And so uh, it's Mitch McConnell, Leader McConnell's already said it's DOA, but extending the PPP is something that makes sense and seems like we need to do. Eight weeks seems insufficient, frankly. As you and you said that earlier, so yeah, 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 and and see that's the one good thing, that, you know. It, hopefully, they won't take this little the new bill, the bipartisan bill that we're going to be voting on next week, and they don't they don't mess it up. They yeah. can't, they, you know. Again, they they have a test; they can't help themselves. <laughs> and if they think they can hitch something to this wagon, they will hitch it and they'll load it down until the wheels fall off and the wagon runs off in the ditch, and you know, or gets stuck, and the. But this is this is this is just a first start. Now I'd, I'd like to see more flexibility. Also, if we do have a real package put together, given the governors of each state's more more ability to decide this unemployment stuff, yeah. uh, you know whether or not you get the six hundred. Why why are you making more money unemployed than when you were employed? You know there should have been again unintended consequences rush legislation. But I would love to see the CEOs of each state given the flexibility because they I think they're going to be in a position. To, to, to fire up their economies a lot quicker than the federal government. Yeah, because I believe the legislation, the CARES Act, is drafted, uh, states that if you're eligible for at least $1 of state unemployment benefits, you're eligible for the $600 federal kicker per week. Yeah, that again, that wasn't, that wasn't um, you know, we, we would not have supported that you know, and if we weren't in such a rush, yeah, to, I understand. Uh, get get the relief to the American people. Um, but but you know, so some of the good things, you know, I know we've all we we talk about a lot of stuff, and you know, we you know, going back to China, you know, we we have to, you know, we've created a, a coronavirus China task force that's being led by uh, Mike McCall out of Texas. He was he was my homeland security chairman when I served on that committee. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that we need to be doing. You know, not just our supply chain, but we need to be looking at our energy security. And you know, we we were there uh, before the Russia and um, Saudi Arabia and yeah. Uh, oil fight that they had, but you know, food security. And now, you know, we've introduced an aquaculture bill. You know, because right now, ninety percent of our seafood is imported, and more than fifty percent of the imported seafood is actually grown through aquaculture. Hmm. And America, we just don't do it because there's too much, too much red tape, too much limitations. But you know, we've seen, you know, the fact that you know the supply 
supply chain is actually affecting our food security in our country, and it could be could have been worse. Why don't we become food independent and by pursuing our aquaculture right here on the Gulf Coast? And not only will it create better seafood choices for the American people, but it'll create good jobs uh, along the coastal communities and and well inside the coastal communities because a lot of times the feed that you procure comes from the midwest and farming community so it's not just a coastal job creator it'll create jobs all across america absolutely congressman we're up against the break can you hang with us i want to talk to you about uh some possible aid uh, well aid it looks like that's coming to the seafood industry in mississippi can you hang with us yeah, ab- absolutely. We'll take a little break. We'll come back, and we're talking to Congressman Stephen Palazzo of Mississippi's 4th District on Super Talk Mississippi. The J- Welcome back, everyone, to the JT Show on this Friday, Super Talk Mississippi Memorial Day weekend. On the line with us, continuing the discussion, Congressman Stephen Palazzo of Mississippi's 4th District. So, Congressman, I, I saw an- a report where the Secretary of Commerce, that would be Wilbur Ross, has allocated... Uh, some money to uh, from the CARES Act as aid to uh, fishermen in U.S. and in particular the seafood industry, and I think Mississippi is stands to uh, receive some of that relief, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, well, the, the most recent that that we've seen, and there is some funds in the CARES Act as well, um, is Mississippi is going to receive 21.3 million in federal fisheries disaster relief. Okay. Uh, now, this is you know directly related to last year's uh, devastation of ah. the Mississippi town sound because of the you know the Bonnie Carey spillway opening, which yep. was called records amount of freshwater. Uh, you know, intrusion into the sound and destroyed destroyed our seafood industry. Uh, and so this this money, but you know, it, it's been almost a year. Uh, you know, we we were fortunate to uh, under uh, Governor Bryant to support his disaster, fisheries disasters declaration. Uh, and soon after, we started begin having meetings with um, the Secretary of Commerce, um, uh, uh, Mr. Ross, Secretary Ross, to in in fortunately he was able to ex expedite the disaster declaration to get the process moving much faster um but still i mean a year after the disaster is is a very long time which kind of you know uh dovetails into what i'm uh, you know senator wicker and, and senator high smith and myself we've all introduced what we call the fishery funds act which would actually set a timeline for the federal government to respond in a timely manner for the and also timeliness for the dispersion dispersion of at you know the appropriate funds um and to do this in a streamlined process because this it's taken years for the fishing communities to receive receive uh, uh, you know support after a disaster declaration and 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 many of them have waited years but fortunately uh you know we had a we had a, a president who and, and a secretary who understood the urgency of this but to prevent this from happening in the future we've introduced the fund act to um, again to make it more transparent to get the aid after the disaster faster to those who have been directly affected because you know our mississippi co- uh, community you know formerly one once known as the seafood capital of the world, um, you know, these these fishermen are generational. And it's a lot yeah. like we've seen in the farming communities. You know, if you lose, like, if, you're, if your children or your children's children don't go into this industry, then, you know, it's, it's not being supplanted with new people coming into it. So, we, you know, we've seen that over the years, and then we've enacted a bunch of plans to get new people into the farming industry. But the seafood industry, it's a lot more difficult. Mm-hmm. And... Um, we do we depend on those generational farmers to produce uh, the best seafood uh, in the world, which comes right out of the Mississippi Gulf of Mexico. Yeah, so I, I'm just reading the report here. Eighty eight million, I think, is is what uh, the press release from the uh, D- Department of Commerce states uh, the, for Alabama, Louisiana, Mississippi specifically. And, and you're right. I, I appreciate that correction. It has nothing to do with COVID or the CARES Act. This is specifically related to the, the uh, opening of the Bonnie Carey Spillway. How do we keep this from happening in the future? Well, okay, so, so you're talking about the, the devastation. Yes, of, the Bonnie Carey itself. The, right, yeah. right. Well, well we, we've, we've been very active in in 
talk, you know, basically asking the core, you know, how are we going to mitigate against future disasters, and you know, and how are we going to, you know, make sure that we're not, you know, we're using the best science and technology that we have uh, to understand these trigger mechanisms on the Mississippi River. That that that, and you know, and I understand the the core. Yeah. Their hands are kind of tied, but you know we don't understand. Is like you know you've probably heard this too. It's like, well, why wasn't the Morganza open yeah, a little bit? Exactly. Why can't we do this a little quicker? A little like, look, last year was a historic flood event. Everything that could have gotten rain got rain at the same time, and all that water came down. It's devastating. But you know, so we're we're holding the core count. We we we've worked on legislation to where we want to have a fisheries expert on the the panel we want to be notified you know there needs to be more of an advanced notification so we could weigh in um but the biggest thing is we we've enacted a study in the latest word of um the, the water resources uh legislation forcing with the money was we're gonna we're We've put the money there to to force the core to do a and 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 basically an environmental impact study, not just of a small section, but of the entire Lower Mississippi River to include the Sound, to include Louisiana, include Mississippi's coastline. So we fully can understand the impacts these decisions make on you know that that as things are happening upriver how they're going to impact downriver but this also goes to the same thing it's common sense that why haven't we had this but why why haven't we also gotten the pumps and the in the yazoo backwaters you know it's those things yeah. i mean we we're, we're they're flooded again from what mm-hmm. i understand around eagle lake and you know they and they people would tell me that these pumps would you know protect the uh the farmland and protect uh, uh property uh that's being just devastated uh annually the state of mississippi needs a break doesn't it i mean it just <laughs> it seems like we're just getting hammered i mean besides this pandemic uh, we were already as you pointed out dealing with record flooding and we got it in our delta we've got the bonnie Carey devastating our seafood industry we need a dead gum break yeah yeah <laughs> I, I agree um you know we're, we're we're probably the most resilient people on the face of the earth have to be you, you, <laughs> <laughs> tornadoes, hurricanes, yeah. flooding. Now we got plagues and you know viruses. But I, I think what it makes us do is it just gives us a greater resolve and it just stiffens our spine a little more and it just makes us a force to reckon with. Yeah, um, not just in D.C. but you know um, uh, you know in in the region as as a well, as well because we rec- we recognize that things that, that should have been done haven't been done, but we're going to get them done. A couple of minutes left. Wanted to turn our attention to. Uh, politics a little bit. I know it's hard to believe, but we're going to elect a president and, of course, every member of the House uh, coming up this November and several in the Senate. But what do you think about these recent polls that uh, are showing the president trailing uh, his presumptive Democrat opponent, Joe Biden? I, you, you know, um, it, it baffles me, but, you know, that they, these same polls and these same pundits had Hillary Clinton beating, uh, uh, our president, uh, you know, four years ago as well. Yeah. So the one, the one good thing is these polls cannot be trusted. The, uh, <laughs> the silent majority is out there and there, and I believe, um, Undoubtedly, that they are ready to reelect Trump to four more years. They know no. They know um, the sleepy Joe is just not up to the task for this. And and what be probably scares them even more because you know people kind of like Joe, uh, you know. And it's who's he going to pick to be his running mate? Because you, you know I think Joe tried to mark out that territory where he's uh, you know moderate. You know, moderate conservative, yeah. moderate liberal. You know, somewhere in the middle, nice guy. You know, somebody you want to have a beer with, and <laughs> you know. But what kind of crazy um, left wing lunatic are they going to pick to kind of balance the party to get the Bernie Sanders, to get the Elizabeth Warrens, um, and because you know, just again, I just say if if the Democrats were running. Right now, first of all, we would have never had the hottest economy in the world. We would have never passed the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that actually paved the way um, to having the hottest economy in the world. We we wouldn't have rebuilt our military to to provide for our national security. And and, and if all those things hadn't been done and then we got hit with a pandemic, I'm afraid we would be under martial law right now. I I think you're right. 
they'd be trying to seize our guns, seize our assets, and punish punish those who are just exercising their constitutional rights to uh, be free men and women in this nation. And so the, every election, Jared, has consequences. Our U.S. Senate seat, that is up. We cannot take anything for granted. We need Senator Hyde Smith back in there, you know, supporting Mississippi values and our deeply held American values, um, which, you know, so we need to not say, well, oh, she's got it. We're in a deep red state. Well, you know, we've seen surprises in the past where, you know, voter participation wasn't where it was supposed to be and people got sent home. We can't afford to lose one seat. I think we're going to win back the House. We're going to retire Nancy Pelosi once and for all as Speaker. Um, but, you know, while I'm focusing on the House, I'm also focused on those one or two, three Senate seats. We we cannot allow the Senate to be flipped and the Democrats to, to gain power, because the more that they gain, the more that you, the individual, is going to lose uh, over your freedoms and liberties. And, be, that, and that scares me. It'd be devastating if, if it became an all-Democrat government, honestly. Uh, and all you got to do is look at what Pelosi has inserted in all these bills to see exactly what they're intent and agenda is all about and see what they're doing across the country in the blue states which we've talked about congressman it's been a pleasure having you on the show as it always is i appreciate you taking that time sir please have a good weekend and we'll talk to you soon well listen enjoy memorial day and let's also reflect on those who sacrificed all so we could be a free nation so thank you and god bless you amen thank you congressman